how often do you witness ping pong? Very often. Maybe even almost every day, although you may not even realize it. How is this possible? Let's see. In 1955, the president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, after a failed attempt to buy weapons for the Egyptian army from the United States and Great Britain, made a weapons deal with the Soviet Union. United States and Great Britain, worrying about the increasing influence of the Soviet Union in the Middle East, responded by stopping the financing of the construction of the S-1 dam on the Nile, a dam which was important for the industrialization of Egypt. Nasser then took over the Suez Canal Company, which governed the canal and nationalized it. Great Britain, France, which had shares in the company, and Israel, which felt threatened by Egypt, attacked Egypt to stop the nationalization and to depose Nasser. The attack provoked the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, to threaten nuclear attack on London and Paris. The President of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower, furious that the attack wasn't consulted with the USA, denied any financial help to Great Britain, which financial situation increasingly worsened. Ultimately, the invasion had been terminated under the pressure of the United Nations and the USA without reaching its goals. Let's see how various arguments about the invasion could look like. The canal had been built and governed by a private company, the Suez Canal Company, owned by the international shareholders. According to the agreement, the Suez Canal Company leased the canal until 1968. The nationalization was a misappropriation of private property. Nationalization isn't a breach of international law. It's being practiced all over the world and it was permitted by the constitution of Egypt. If the shareholders didn't like the laws of Egypt, they could have invested somewhere else. By taking over the canal, Nasser broke the Treaty of 1954, which allowed Great Britain to keep personnel in the Suez Canal area in exchange for the withdrawal of the British troops from the area. Great Britain had to react to this unilateral breach of the treaty. What Great Britain and its allies did was an act of unlawful aggression. Sending military forces to another country without its agreement is a breach of international law and a declaration of war. Nasser was a dictator who thwarted democratic progress in Egypt and was responsible for many incidents of human rights violations. By allowing for the hostile takeover of the canal, the United Nations signaled to other dictators that they can break any laws and agreements without any consequences. Such actions should not remain without response. The great majority of Egyptians supported Nasser because he cared about the well-being of Egypt. The British had no moral right to condemn the Soviet intervention in Hungary, right when their military had been conducting aggression in Egypt. Israel had a right to defend itself against Nasser, who supported attacks of Palestinian partisans in Israel and turned Egypt into a safe haven for Nazis escaping from justice. Nasser had good reasons to harm Egypt against Israel. He saw that Israel started to buy weapons from France and he viewed it as a country dangerous to Arabs. It was an unwise action on Great Britain, which did not take into account many things, like the American reaction, reaction of Arab countries, which reacted by cutting off oil supplies to Great Britain and France, or economical and political costs of this intervention. The West had to react when the Soviet Union was gaining a new ally in the Middle East and was increasing its influence in the region. What those arguments show is the complexity of such issues, issues that are characterized by the presence of multiple sides with different opinions, values, interests, goals, or even a single side having multiple goals that may require conflicting actions, actions characterized by a variety of aspects, multiple actual consequences, multiple possible alternative consequences, and so on. Such issues provoke what I call ping-pong discussions, such discussions arise between people who already have a strong opinion about a given issue, opinion that usually comes from a narrow, one-sided understanding of it. They arise between people who are emotionally attached to their opinions and only listen to the other side to respond by invalidating its point of view by any arguments available. And it doesn't matter that much whether the arguments respond directly to what was being said, whether they are strong arguments, or even whether they are directly relevant to the subject. What matters is to affirm one's own view on the issue, to invalidate other views or goals as obviously wrong, to express emotions related to the issue, to have the last word, to win the discussion. Better 
wider understanding of various aspects of the issue is not the goal. Gentler forms of ping-pong discussions may resemble discussions which purpose is to actually explore the issue. More heated ping-pong discussions become riddled with fallacies, personal attacks, or even insults, and generally they do not make people smarter about the issue, but dumber. And that is the type of discussions that you see and hear more and more often in modern, increasingly confused and frustrated times, especially when you use the internet. Why it should be considered bad? I hope I do not have to explain. So, what is the conclusion, the purpose of this video? It's an introduction to the next video, where I will propose a bit different, broader and detailed way of thinking and discussing about issues.